Merry Christmas and a prosperous New Year in advance. Welcome to your favorite health program on TV, Health Affair, a platform where we beam such light on public health issues, challenges of women and children with a view to finding lasting solutions. I am your regular anchor, Ushu Mowa Daniels. On the program today, we shall be discussing about goiter. Goiter is an enlargement of the thyroid gland in the neck. After our new segment, we'll come back with a medical expert who will be telling us more about Garter. Please stay tuned. The devastation that rocked Wuhan and the entire country of China when the coronavirus broke out in 2019 brought fear upon humanity. It didn't take much time to spread across the globe and got declared by the World Health Organization as a pandemic. Nigeria recorded an index case through an Italian traveler who migrated from Ogun State to Lagos in February 2020 as the novel virus ravaged humanity, resulting to a lockdown, including closure of worship centers across the world. Many prayed for a divine intervention. Who knows if it was these prayers that brought about the timely discovery of the COVID-19 vaccines. The vaccines finally arrived earlier than expected, and this became another problem to many people, especially in the West African subregion. Many came up with claims why the vaccines are unsafe for human, and social media did not help the situation. Necessary trials have not been done, and that is why some of these companies, for some companies are, are, are issuing disclaimers that should anything go wrong, they will not be held liable legally. So we are calling on the government to suspend the use of these vaccines. After all, the disease itself is curable. So why we continue to use the available cure we have, we wait until we are sure that vaccines that are safe for use is produced. The resultant effect of this has been an increase in infection rate and COVID-19 related deaths, especially with the declaration of a fourth wave of the pandemic in Nigeria and the discovery of new variants. It is to change this narrative that the Health Writers Association of Nigeria, Ewan, came up with the theme building confidence in COVID-19 vaccines in their 2021 annual symposium. There are so many stories out there. People uh, get some of the, these stories on social media talking about vaccination and people don't even understand it. There are so many stories people have talked about when you take it, you will die in two years. People have talked about 5G. People have talked about so many things. And that is why some of us, even among the media, many of us are not even vaccinated up to this minute. So, and that is why we said, let us sensitize ourselves, let us understand everything concerning vaccines and we'll be able to now communicate it. It's only when you understand an issue, that is the only time you'll be able to communicate to the whole, uh, to the general public. As health writers, especially at this time, there's a responsibility you all have. The power of the pen is have a huge role and I think your, the theme and your focus is very apt at this time where you're talking about building confidence in COVID-19 vaccines and addressing vaccine hesitancy. The event also provided an opportunity for deliberations about the UK ban on Nigeria, the expired vaccines and lots more. Uh, I want us to look at the situation about what happened in Europe. These are people who have seen or come overcome the issue of the Delta. Uh, and then, even though they vaccinated their people, people are still dying. And now you are told that a new variant is coming that may be more dangerous than, uh, than Delta. So the next reaction I've been for any proactive country is to stop that one coming in so that they can take care of what is with them. So a lot of the people were saying it's discriminatory, is this, and I think I asked the question, put yourself in their place. You know, what will you do? If this virus before has been de devastating your people, the vaccines don't seem to be working at that time. You now told a new one is coming. I think as a proactive country, you make sure that you know you do something. And when you listen to them, they're saying we are taking this as a temporary step to you know to collect our system together. So I don't blame them for what is happening. They have a way of playing to the gallery. At a time we don't do what we're supposed to do. I was reading a report this morning that says about one million doses of COVID-19 vaccine will be discarded or has been discarded. How come people have not taken those vaccines? How come we allow the vaccines to expire? 
So it's not a matter of making noise and shouting that, oh, what they did is not bad, this is that and that, human rights and so on and so forth. But what have we done, you know, in terms of, for example, producing vaccines in Nigeria? The takeaways for everybody, um, we're in the middle of a pandemic and um, got information that about a million doses of vaccines in Nigeria expired last month. And um, we've been talking about us manufacturing our own vaccines. Um, Professor Tomori has given us, you know, the way forward. Nigeria, we really need to up our act. We need to be serious. We need to get our acts together. And the same thing for Nigerians too. You know, we have to take our future in our hands. It's not enough to be blaming the Western world for our own woes. We need to come together and take care of our problems. This time around, vaccine production in Nigeria has kick-started and there is no looking back. Not only for COVID-19, but for other future disease outbreaks. Also, on behalf of NIMA, we appreciate the federal government who provided the intervention fund and also contributed to putting this platform together and also enabling NIMA to acquire state-of-the-art equipment to support vaccine development in Nigeria. I must also thank on behalf of NIMA, MTA, who recently donated uh, an oligosynthesizer to NIMA, enabling NIMA to produce its in-house primers and probes, and also to produce for other institutions that are into molecular biology uh, research. I will advise that we all focus on the common goal for establishing this platform and see how this platform will stand and achieve its goals and objectives. It is actually unfortunate that uh, many of the investments that we have had in terms of uh, COVID-19 response in this country is on the palliative side. And that is not a solution. We actually try as much as possible to palliate the, so, uh, the, the problems. So for us at TED Fund, we are looking at it beyond that because we are clear about the roadmap of the WHO World Health Organization to countries on what has to be done. About 11, I mean about 10 pillars that we have in the blueprint, and as a country, we are not actually looking at any one of them headlong the way we ought to do. So that was why the intervention of TED Fund becomes critical because this is a national challenge. This is a, 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 pan, a global pandemic. It's not about Nigeria alone. Even if we said we are in the space of a tertiary in the education system, we are not happy that our schools are closed. So it becomes on us that uh, it is important for us to intervene at this critical period. And uh, we can see that what can help the country, like all other countries, uh, is the institutionalization of research and development and making sure that we deploy the instrumentality of research and development to look for solution, not only about palliative, because the truth is that if we continue the way of palliative, we become a beggar and an embarrassment. We can see what uh, the old world are calling the travel appetite now. We can see even the latest one about shipping of almost expired vaccine to Africa. I mean, for God's sake, you can see the apathy of people not taking the vaccine because they don't know where it is being produced. So they don't know where it is being shipped off. So if it is something that we have produced, they know my brothers, your sisters, everybody was involved in the production system. People have more trust and they can actually, that can change the apathy that we have in the vaccine uh, and the vaccination process in the country. Yes, uh, we can see that uh, about four or five centers have come together uh, with the same lofty idea of developing of a COVID vaccine uh, for Nigeria and beyond. And it's a very good move in that uh, we are looking and tapping all those resources, both human and facilities, uh, from our various uh, institutions. So it's a very good one. And uh, with that, we have the hope and the belief that uh, with this caliber of uh, experts, that are here today and with that determination and then the kind of funding that uh, is coming uh, from TED Fund, I think this is uh, a welcome uh, development 
and I see that uh, uh, Nigeria is going to uh, deliver the vaccine in not too long a distance. The Director General, Nigerian Institute of Medical Research, Professor Babatunde Salako, has called on Nigerian government to put in place policies that will support homegrown solutions to tackling disease outbreak, especially pandemics like the COVID-19 virus that has ravaged humanity since 2019. The Director General made this call at the 2021 annual retreat of the Institute held in Lagos, Nigeria. He said the pandemic was a blessing in disguise that has birthed many developmental strides that should be sustained. Government should provide such policy so we can save our foreign and uh, money. But if they don't do that, we will produce homegrown solutions. They are not the newest because there are solutions already produced elsewhere, which we are now saying the ones that we have produced work well, if not better. But then people are used to all these um, instruments and gadgets from abroad. And Nigerians generally have this appetite for foreign things. And so if you do make it made in Nigeria, we we'll be like, ah, this one, you know, don't, better don't use it, you know, that kind of a thing. But if government has a body put together to say, okay, this claim has been made, test it, tell us if the claim is true. Once the claim is true, government should provide their policy support to say they should be used. Because they are produced in Nigeria, they are likely to be cheaper than um, the one that you have to bring abroad. You don't need dollar to go and pick it. You can buy it in Naira. Sometimes it's more efficient. With a central focus on integrity and accountability in workplace, the WHO country representative, Walter Kazadi Molumbo, who was represented at the event, urged Nigerians to ensure transparency in all their dealings at workplace. Uh, corruptions, uh... It is the, the war against integrity, you know. If you have corruptions in workplace, you cannot achieve. So it is very important to set the rules of integrity and the rules of transparency. It have to, be a, to have integrity, to have transparency, and as we said before, uh, to achieve, if you want to achieve results, to have, if it has good outcome and good impact. And that, as we said before, this will never be happen and unless you have a very strong accountability framework, so each one will be held accountable, so we can achieve. I point of the event was the presentation of a word to the Director General, Professor Babat de Salako, and some other individuals who have supported the Institute in no small measure. Half of Sadikon Naima, this award is presented to you for your marvelous achievements in Naima. Every day in Nigeria and around the African continent, patients walk into health centers seeking treatment for one illness or the other. Every day, they walk in believing that their health challenge, no matter how dire, has a form of treatment or cure. They walk in trusting their doctor has the right tools to know what is wrong and how to fix it. Yet many times every day, patients walk out disappointed. I'm sure many of you can bear witness to this. They are disappointed because their healthcare provider or local laboratory lacks the latest technology to detect their illness. They are disappointed because their medical tests are conducted abroad at high costs, making them unaffordable. They are also disappointed because every second spent waiting for medical test results from outside the country is lost for treatment. They are disappointed because what ails them has been detected too late or misdiagnosed. And in many cases, as you know, we say it's from the village. When 54 Gene commenced its operations in 2019, we committed to putting the patient first in everything we do. 
Since then, everything we've done has been driven by the passion for seeing African patients obtain world-class precision medicine-related services. We also understand the power of affordability because we know that the average patient living in Africa also deserves world-class healthcare. We understand the power of advanced technology because every healthcare provider wants the best treatment outcomes for their patients, powered by precise medical results. Today, we are excited to announce the launch of Seven River Labs. So for us, we see a world where Nigerians and Africans have access to advanced testing delivered at labs in this country at competitive price points and in the time frame that works for both the patient and the provider. And we will work every day to keep that vision alive and make it a reality for everyone uh, that we serve. That for us is what we believe to be precision diagnostics. But let me go into a little bit more detail of why we're different versus some of our competitors uh, that have existed in the marketplace uh, for a long time. There are three differences that Seven River Labs will bring to the table. One is advanced, accessible, and affordable. So think of it as the three A's of testing. And let me talk a little bit about the advanced technology. In the building uh, that we're in today, downstairs, is, sits probably the most sophisticated private lab in Africa. We can do a whole range of things that no government lab or most of our private sector competitors cannot do. Effectively, what people used to send abroad to the United States or to India or to the UK can be done just one flight of stairs below uh, from here. It's been built quietly, uh, but it is an astonishing victory in terms of helping transform healthcare on this continent. Um, we've invested in bringing the latest technology to Nigeria. Some of these are technologies that allow us to look for specific indications uh, in patients, uh, whether it's a condition or an infection. We can also look at genetic risk factors for a range of situations. I think as Dr. Bassi noted, we all have a friend, a relative, uh, or a colleague whose family member has been rushed to the US or India with a stage four breast cancer. Today, you don't have to wait till the end because effectively, once you have stage four breast cancer, what doctors do for you is simply manage you to the point where you pass away. Now, with the technologies we have active downstairs, we can tell you long before it actually becomes a problem that you have the likelihood of getting a certain type of breast cancer. For us, that is truly why we do this, is the chance to save a life. It can be my life, it can be your life, it can be your sister, your brother, but the important thing is we've now made the investment to create infrastructure where that life-saving decision can be made. And we hope as we roll out across the country and the continent, that more people will begin to see healthcare in a very different way. Rather than wait till the end, we're 10 years ahead of the curve. And those tests that we'll be offering, it's not just about cancer, it's not just about COVID, which what most people know us for. So we have, we help pioneer COVID testing in Nigeria, and today we're still at the forefront of that innovation. So you can get your COVID test back in less than six hours. Uh, which is something most other folks cannot deliver. That is the result of the advanced technology we put in. Um, it, you know, I, I was astounded to see that 33 million babies in Nigeria die every year from congenital disorders and neonatal birth defects. This is unreal, and we want to help curb this. We want to help mothers, parents, siblings get better understanding of, of disorders and, and infections so that they can have a better quality of life. But we know we cannot do this alone. We cannot do this without you. We need your support to drive our success. 
We need your support to drive our numbers to be successful. We sincerely appreciate your excellent coverage of our Seven River Lab diagnostic launch. We feel with your professional work is in its best tradition and we like to thank you for this. In our annual general meeting for 2021, um, what we do is every year we gather at the end of the year to look at topical issues and um, how we can brainstorm on advising government on policy and also getting government input into some of these policy decisions. So for this year we are looking at um, tackling the challenge of human resource for health in Lagos State. And um, what we've seen is of course there are challenges with brain drain all over the world, worse in Nigeria where a lot of our healthcare professionals are living. But we know that Lagos State Government has been trying to do a lot in terms of employment of doctors, nurses, other healthcare workers. But of course people also leave and resign and go to other climbs. So for somebody like me, what I think about is how can we tackle healthcare financing? Because we know that healthcare financing is one of the major challenges that we have. Once there's no money, you can't get manpower, you can't retain them, you can't give them necessary tools, you can't give them the necessary welfare packages that are necessary for them to stay in Nigeria. So that's one issue that I think um, needs to be tackled and, on, and that's going to be taken from both sides. The government has a role to play. We need to increase budgetary allocation to health. We know Lagos State is trying but we need to get to the target of at least 8-10% as a minimum of our budget for health and I think that's going to drive a lot. And then from the private sector too and even from the community so the issue of health insurance needs to be looked into. The topic is quite apt um, because presently everybody is aware of the challenges we are having with Human Resource for Health with the pull and push factor. Um, I'm sure Nigerians will remember some months ago that um, some people came from Saudi to do interview doctors. And even during COVID last year, there was, during the lockdown, there was um, an exemption made for some doctors to be airlifted to UK. And that's to show you the extent at which the demand for the services of Nigerian healthcare professionals outside the country is huge. And so we feel that there is need for us to have a discussion on this issue to see what the government can do to ensure that as much as possible we retain our best brains in Nigeria. We cannot develop a healthcare system that can address all the needs of the health sector, including uh, emergencies like this without the human resources. So emphasis must be placed on human resources. Unfortunately, in this environment, we have severe shortage. We have a lot of migration. That shortage again, compounded by brain drain. People are even living in droves now, different categories of health workers. And the key resources we need to tackle epidemics like this are also few in number. We need to develop all those first, all, I mean, all those, all those things. So it's a major focus area that all governments, both federal, state, government must face. Lagos has started it, but we need to build on it. We tend to concentrate on uh, the curative aspect of care. And the most important aspect of that is prevention, I mean promotion and prevention, which is needed again in this environment here needed again under this COVID thing. We hardly fund. If you look at the um, health accounts, less than 8% of the expenditure of health in this environment goes into preventive care. This is a shame. It's totally unacceptable. You say prevention is better than care, right? You say uh, whatever it starts from home. That's one area we're not facing. With the announcement of the fourth wave of coronavirus and most recently the emergence of the new variants, uh, Omicron, uh, the takeaway for us within the system as well as the general public is to re-intensify our protective preventive measures.
and these are simple and practical to carry out. Avoidance of unnecessary crowd and close packed gatherings without maintaining social distance. The Lagos state government has shot 34 medicine outlets at Shomolu, Bariga, Bagada and Ifako areas of Shomolu and Koshofe local government areas as well as Bell and Savage streets in Orile Igomu local council development area for non-compliance to regulatory standards. Commissioner for Health Akin Abayomi, who disclosed this, explained that the affected outlets were short for compromising regulations guiding the operations of sales of medicines in the state. He added that sales of drugs are only allowed in registered and licensed outlets and patent medicine vendors are authorized to sell drug products only in their original and approved pack size as produced by the manufacturing companies. According to the commissioner, the recent operation was a follow-up by the tax force to sanitize the drug distribution chain in Lagos State. Reports from some experts over time have shown that a lot of sexual and gender-based violence cases are not reported due to fear of alleged victimization by some security operatives who should be a source of hope and comfort to victims. It is to change this narrative that this three-day training for officials of the National Security and Civil Defense Corps NSCDC and the Nigerian police became necessary. When uh, we are looking at victims of gender-based violence, we have to remember that these are our people, these are our sisters, our mothers, our daughters, that anyone can be a victim of gender-based violence. Nobody asks for it, nobody deserves it, and everyone can be a victim of it. So this goes all the way through society from the top to the bottom. And these are our relatives, our sisters, our brothers. We have to think of it that way so that when, when victims of gender-based violence come to the police, we understand who they are. They are part of our family. 100 security operatives benefited from the initiative organized in collaboration between the U.S. government and partners. In our work to make sure that um, no one is left behind, we have decided to engage law enforcement officers who are usually the first point of call in addressing cases of gender-based violence. Um, in our work, we've engaged over 700 police officers, but particularly for this training, 100 police officers were trained. That's um, 50 from the Nigerian police force and also 50 from the NSCDC um, agents. So basically, um, we're thankful to the U.S. Consulate General Lagos State for sponsoring us. The challenge of gender-based violence called to cross sexual molestation, physical assaults, domestic violence to various forms of economic deprivation, job discrimination, amongst others. A common example of these are women in the driving profession. We drive on boats, Uber, Kekemarua, BRT. So the association is actually, you know, to bring all these ladies together with the main purpose of empowering those that need empowerment, encouraging those that need encouragement, and most importantly, for our voice to be heard. People in the society see us as weak. The world see us as weak as their so You understand? So because of that, when, when, we, when we are victims of any kind of violence, we always run into our shells because we always feel vulnerable because this is the tag that they have already put in us. I think this is the major challenges we are having. We are not able to come out to speak. You understand? Because the, 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 this thing is already there like a stigma. Many of us get turned down because simply because you're a female. It's awkward. In a society like this, if a woman decides to stand up to do something she's passionate about. Many of us here, not just being forced into the profession, many of us are passionate about what we do. Many persons get uh, stimulated from inside, get motivated. So you don't really need to push the person. It's not like something that is forced on someone. Many persons, many women that drive, drive with a passion. Many of them have it as their major hustle. 
Some of them have it as their side hustle. You can't take it away from them. Even if they have a job that they are into, a regular job, they still find time to drive. For some of these women who have narrated their experience and challenges, they want society and government to treat them better and not see them as lesser human beings to their male counterparts who are players in the business. interaction with women on wheels in Nigeria was part of activities to mark the UN 16 days of activism against gender-based violence. The Omicron COVID variant is a new one, which is coming from uh, South Africa. Actually, it was uh, first reported in Botswana, but it was discovered by the South African scientists. It is one that has over 50 mutations, 30 of them in which are in the spike. You know, the spike is the one that the virus used to attach to the body, uh, to the cells. But also, the thing you want of these 30, 10 are new in what you call that special part of the spike that you use to bind onto the cells. And it's for this reason that uh, WHO has looked at it, and there's a, a fear that it may uh, be a different virus, which may, may be worse than the Delta strain or the Delta variant. It has been reported in a few other countries, in as far as Hong Kong, Israel, uh, Botswana itself, and South Africa. I think they're having quite a lot of number of cases from South Africa. So, uh, uh, the, on the issue of some cases being recorded amongst people with, who have been vaccinated, yes, that's expected. I mean, if it's a new strain, it will not be, the immunity will not be as specific as with the, against the virus for which it was, uh, uh, which the vaccine was produced. So it is expected. And, but the good thing is that vaccination is always good because you're not going to find these people getting severe disease or dying from it. Welcome back. I told you earlier that our focus today will be on goiter, a condition that increases the size of your thyroid. A goiter can be caused by a variety of factors and conditions, but the commonest cause as identified by the World Health Organization, WHO, is iodine deficiency. Goiter comes in different types and risk factors include age, hereditary, gender and lots more. Let's listen to a consultant surgeon, Dr. Sally Hosseini, to tell us more about goiter. Lack of iodine in salt or uh, water intake can be a major cause, a major factor related to this. Uh, inflammation, uh, we call them thyroiditis. These are also uh, likely causes. Sometimes infections can also cause uh, enlargement of goiter. But in some situations you have use of drugs, uh, some anti-inflammatory drugs, some uh, anti-tuberculous uh, drugs, all these can actually uh, result and cough syrups. This can uh, result in the uh, enlargement of the thyroid gland. And uh, in majority of the case, you really don't know or cannot really attach uh, any factor, particularly to this uh, enlargement. Uh, so commonly what you see is the enlarged gland and there may be history of similar enlargement within that environment. Sometimes there is a family, familiar relationship. Uh, you have a family that has had it and another person is having it within the family. 
these are uh, common uh, presentations. Quetta uh, uh, can be toxic, it can be malignant, then it can be uh, non-toxic. Uh, it's toxic when you have a high level of thyroxine, which is produced, and thyroxine is involved with uh, metabolic responses, so which causes a lot of uh, metabolic activity like sweating, weight loss, excessive fluid I mean, food intake uh, without weight gain, uh, tremor, and some other uh, things that has to do with uh, um, uh, metabolism. So when a patient presents with that type of uh, swelling of the thyroid gland, associated with those metabolic uh, issues, we say it is toxic goita. That means you need to control that toxicity before you can be able to properly treat that uh, goiter. Because uh, sometimes or most of the time, the final treatment of goiter end up in surgery and you cannot operate a patient with toxic goiter. Sometimes you may have patients with goiter that is malignant. That means it has some cancer in it. And some of them have similar uh, presentation with uh, that of uh, toxicity so you need to be able to do it. they can have weight loss they can sometimes have obstructive features which means that they have problem with swallowing or a change in their voice these are things that point more towards the direction of uh, it may be a malignant uh, goiter and sometimes you just have a goiter that is solely there's no uh, toxic symptoms but they can be nodular I mean, it has multiple nodules within it. Uh, it can be diffuse. So if it's diffuse and it's related to uh, hormonal changes in the body, some of those can respond to some level of medical treatment. But when it's uh, toxic or it's uh, multinodular, a lot of time they end up with uh, surgical uh, treatment. A lot of people carry these things around without... Uh, paying attention to it or more because of the fear of uh, if I get there they will say they want to operate me and I cannot allow anybody to put knife in my neck that is why the people that are doing the job are trained so when you have these features you can assess a lot of hospitals especially public hospitals and some private hospitals where the specialization is there but like I used to tell people every doctor is trained in every aspect of medicine so any qualified doctor should be able to diagnose a goiter. So if you walk into any qualified hospital, you'll be able to have somebody make the diagnosis. Now left whether that person is able to operate you or manage you or not. Uh, the endocrinologists take care of the hormonal changes that comes with uh, goiter when you have thyrotoxicosis and co. But uh, when it comes to fight definitive management, especially with surgery, the general surgeon is the one that are in charge. How deadly is it? Is it treatable? And if it's treatable, what is the success rate of treatment in Nigeria? A toxic goiter can be very fatal. If you have a toxic goiter, you have seen them, you see their eyes bulged out, you see them very frail. If you are close to them, they sweat a lot, they have tremor. And uh, it also have a cardiovascular effect. Such people can have hypertension, you can have changes in the heart that can make the heart to malfunction. And this can result in sudden death. So they can die out of uh, cardiac arrest because of cardiomyopathy that is uh, attached to the disease. So a lot of time, those that are not thyrotoxic, may go around for a long time but having it for too long too can also have a malignant transformation whereby yes it's an ordinary goiter benign but suddenly because i've been there for quite a long time there's change into a malignant one so once you have a cancer there's really no cure for cancer so all you can do is just keep the patient alive and improve the patient's uh, quality of life so a lot of time is better once you notice the changes you present at the hospital. This is not, it's not the type of thing you ask a quack or even among the uh, medical, qualified medical doctors, it's not everybody that manages it. 
He's not even a very specialist and manages it. So a lot of time when you have those cases, you either go to endocrinologist who will take care of the endocrine aspect of it and refer the patient to the surgeon for definitive management. So a few cases can respond to drug. By the time you give some of those drugs, the, uh, the level of uh, the iodine in the body improves. The rate of attempt at compensating by the thyroid gland also reduces and the size reduces, especially when it has some uh, hormonal uh, factor affecting it. Once you correct that hormone, for instance, when you are lactating or you are pregnant, you can have goiter. But by the time you deliver and you stop lactation, then you can suppress. So there are some like that that you need to. But once you have thyroid toxicosis or you have multinodularity, that's still more to surgical uh, uh, management. So that's exactly the way it is. But most of our people are reluctant to go seek care. Sometimes it's because of ignorance. Occasionally it's because of fear. But most time it's because of financial constraint. Because it can be a bit expensive to uh, manage uh, goiter. For instance, if somebody has a toxicity, you need to put that person in a drug for on a drug for at least four to six weeks. That you'll be taking daily. And that such a person will continue that drug until the surgical intervention. So in those days, those drugs used to be very scarce. But today we have them regular, uh, readily available. So once you start that, then by the time we are not going to operate, Gata is not the type of uh, surgery you, I mean, it's type of disease that you say you want to manage surgically by managing things. You have to have everything available because a lot can happen while you're operating the patient. But in the hand of expert, it is standard that you let the patient know the associated likely difficulty that may come. But rarely do you have those complications. Talking about cost, you said it's costly to operate goita. So how can we help people with goita to assess care? What can government do? What can private individuals do to help them assess care? The first thing is for the patient to actually assess care and get their diagnosis. The first treatment or final treatment sometimes is not surgery. So the drugs are used to be very expensive, but they're not that expensive now. Well, with the dollar changes and other stuff, maybe that may have a little effect, but it's not as bad. So government can create some avenue to, if possible, add it to their health insurance thing so that people can benefit. Otherwise, the poor masses will continue to live uh, without getting proper care. What's the take-home message to people with goiter? But like I said, the source of water is one very important uh, and where you live. People that live in hilly areas, like we have some in Udu and Ekiti, uh, some area in uh, Edu Delta, they have hilly area, they have high content of calcium in their water, and that's uh, so when you say you come from some areas like that then people that live on well water may not have enough uh, iodine within it but the solution to that is that we have salts readily available so but if you are not taking iodized salts then you lose the chance of using active adequate uh, iodine so iodized salt is everywhere maybe government can invent invest in the production of uh, iodized salt at a more subsidized uh, price so that people don't just buy any any salt they buy the iodized salt in fact iodized salt play a long a, a lot of role in trying to curb goiter but at the same time you cannot over uh, feed yourself with salt because it has its own disadvantage so it's important that you need to regulate it too because then the public we say ah the we the, the public we say uh they said when we take iodine uh, when you take iodine salt it will give us so then they over shoot uh, their uh, salt intake and that can create another medical problem so enlightenment 
uh, enlightening the public and informing them just like what you're trying to do. We also relieve their fear. Uh, water too. Uh, public water is probably better because it has some level of iodine in it. Uh, but we all know the challenges with uh, public water in this environment. Most people survive on the uh, borehole and the uh, well water, and some even river water and coal. So educating people about the intake of iodine salt will go a long way to reduce this. The key message is once you have a swollen gutter, let the cause be diagnosed. Thank you very much for coming on the show. We appreciate you. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you for having me. If there's anything more you need to clarify with Dr. Hosseini, please reach out to us on the numbers showing on your screen. If you are just joining us, it's Health Affair on AIT. We'll be right back after this break. program is a nutrition segment. The carrot is a root vegetable, usually orange in color. Though white, purple and other varieties of colors do exist. People have been eating carrots for over 5,000 years. The plant, according to researchers, originated in the Middle East and Afghanistan. Carrot was originally cultivated for its leaves and seeds. Carrot is a nutrient-dense root, rich in antioxidants, fiber, beta-carotene, other vitamins and minerals. Consumption of carrots is good for vision, promote air growth, weight loss, regulates blood pressure, lowers cholesterol levels, and helps eliminate toxins from the liver. On our clinical segment, we give you tips for healthy living. Pain could be excruciating. The pain could be very severe. If, if you have this menorrhea, take care of it properly a day or two before the period starts. Start get, no, have a drug that is safe, that will not cause peptic cancer. Start using it maybe a day or two before and then. Usually it will take care of it, it will help the pain to go down. Because those um, big, some of them fibroids can cause this, pelvic tumors can cause this menorrhea too, but otherwise most of them, we don't know the cause. Be a part of nation building by telling us how to improve human lives and improve the nation's health sector on our perception segment. They told them outside the world, there's COVID. And when they stop us from coming to UA, UAE, coming to uh, uh, Canada, coming there again, they start complaining. Why would you <laughs> they not stop us when you told them that you are now the headquarters for Micron Virus in Africa? It's the new business whereby they own up that they have COVID and they receive grants. That is why they have been forced to make every Nigeria to take the injection. The nation's health care cannot be uh, stabilized unless the National Assembly pass a law that no politician in power, nobody in power, should treat, be treated abroad if he fails it. That's the only time they can build and develop the health sector in Nigeria. This is where we draw the curtain on the program today. Thanks for spending your time with us. My name is Ushua Mowa Daniels. Please keep staying safe. Merry Christmas to you and your loved ones and a prosperous new year in advance from all of us at Dara Network TV.